Yankees' United Center, home of the Chicago Blackhawks, who have been welcomed onto the ice by live organ playing since 1929. Frank Pellico, their nimble-fingered organist, accompanies every twist and turn of this refrigerated marathon. Every goal, every penalty, even every punch-up. Wimbledon's centre court, it most certainly is not. The Circus Maximus, more like. has played a part in public spectacle ever since it was invented nearly two and a half thousand years ago. The Romans used organs at their gladiatorial contests. Presumably it was the only thing you could hear above the baying crowd. You can't tell from these ancient mosaics exactly what these instruments sounded like, but they are without doubt the ancestors of today's organ and seem to work on a similar principle. With virtually every other musical instrument, the idea is to create one perfect sound. With the organ, the idea is to create perfect combinations of sounds. And as such, its development has always been one of perpetual motion and evolution. It has a voracious appetite for novelty, variety and experimentation. Over the next four programmes, we're going to go on a bit of a journey to try and discover why people like me have become so fascinated with the beast in the loft. In this first programme, we look at how bellows, pipes and keyboards work together and how the full-blown organ evolved. Perhaps the best place to start is to find one of the earliest examples of the species still standing. This is the heart of medieval Salamanca, a spectacular university town in northwest Spain. Behind me, there are two ancient cathedrals built back to back, and inside is a Pandora's box of historic organs. Tucked away in this cloistered side chapel just next to the old cathedral stands just about the oldest surviving organ in the known universe, up here. Now no one really knows exactly how old this organ is. They used to think it was built in 1380, but modern scholarship has put it at more like 1480. Either way, it's jolly old. Anyway, it has one distinctive feature that I feel I should share with you. As you can see, it's rather deficient in the pipe department. In fact, it's completely empty. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, if that's an organ, then they've got them at Ikea, too, and they're called wardrobes. Well, to establish the difference between an early organ and a wardrobe, we ought to look at some medieval pictures. Whilst there are paintings of a variety of ancient organs, the most common in medieval times were ones you could carry around with you, just the thing for simple and spontaneous music making. The portrayal of them in these pictures is thought to be extremely accurate, apart from the wings, of course. Now, there's a man in Croydon who has dedicated his life to studying these instruments. His hobby is to research the angelic pictures, then build replicas of the organs. His name is Bridges, Jeff Bridges. You must 
lovely, Jeff. <laughs> Hello. Here we are. Oh, nice, nice to meet you. Again. Gosh, what a beautiful thing. Is one of yours? Yes. yes. Absolutely lovely. Go, slip, put it on. Yes, that's a good idea. I'll help you. These miniature organs were built with the roving troubadour in mind. One hand pumps in the air from the bottom, the other plays the 20 or so wooden keys. Jeff, there can't be many people who've got a collection of medieval portative organs in their workshop. There aren't any. So I'm the only person making portative organs. Why have none of these instruments survived? Well, they're very complicated, delicate instruments. You've only got to have a little air leak and it's just no good. Yes. And who were the people that bought these organs? Um, I suppose mainly merchants. That's the, the secular instruments. I think mainly that wealthy merchants had, had them. Yes. So for the amusement in the evening and the dancing. And of course, if you travelled in a distance, you went with the cattle and with the cattle you the musical instruments and the singing and dancing and the frolicking as they called it yeah uh, went with it. have you ever done any frolicking with one of your organs in the back garden <laughs> <laughs> what about the neighbors what do they think well, they just think i'm a crank i think do they well they know i'm a sort of specialist in organs or something but beyond that they, they don't understand it at all they think these are pretty and that sort of thing but do they ever come round and have a look some, at some of them do yes because some of them are quite good musicians themselves yeah. mm. You're, you're an eccentric in this street, do you think? Yes, I'm happy to be balmy. <laughs> Jeff, would you be so kind as to pass me one of your tin pipes? Thank you. Now this, your Commonwealth Garden organ pipe, is a flue pipe. Just like a chimney flue, made from the finest Cornish tin. But you know, there is another type of organ sound altogether. Now this is a crumb horn, it's a sort of primitive wind instrument. And if I take its top off, you'll see that the nasal sound it makes comes from air passing across two little bits of reed. And believe me, reeds to early organ builders were to become rather like toast and marmite at tea time. Savoury and irresistible. At first, reeds were put in mini organs of their own called regals, portable instruments which were popular with princes, dukes and monarchs. Their fanfare sounds were perfect for making you seem awesome and royal. And so from Croydon to Kerborg in the Italian Tyrol. This superb medieval castle behind me is the ancestral home of Count Trapp and his family. No relation, apparently, to that most famous of von Trapps, Julie Andrews. The altitudinous Count, six foot going on seven foot, has a remarkable place here, high on a hill. A few of his favourite things are his magnificent armoury, breathtaking views of hills alive with the sound of music and one of the oldest surviving table organs in the world. An instrument that conveniently illustrates the next stage in the organ's development. Beautiful. Exquisite. Yes, exquisite is a very unique, uh, unique... Uh, and it has its own, its own room just for the organ. Yes, yes. Count, this is a very beautiful instrument. Do you know when it was built? Uh, it was built in, uh, uh, in, in, in 1559 from a, a very important man, he was named was uh, Strobel the Oberammergau in Germany. That makes it um, one of the oldest working oldest organs Oldest working, working organs uh, yeah. in Europe, yes. And for whom yes. was this built? He built it for uh, Knight uh, Jakob Trapp, uh, mm -hmm. the 7th. And, and is, that, is that him there? Yes, is he that's Jakob. Working wood, yeah. 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 He's, He's still here working listening wood. to the organ even now. Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you mind if I, I play? Your... Yes, please. Thank oh, you very much. Sit down. Well, I better get some air into its bellows. 
It's really beautifully inlaid here, of course. It's 500 years old. It's a fantastic condition. It's the bellows warming up. Um, now, around here, I've got draw stops, and this is how the air... I select the air to go into the various pipes. I pull one of these out. It's like taking a plug out of the bottom of a pipe. It's going to allow air to get into those pipes. If I pull this out, this should sound a bit like a recorder. And this one here is going to sound a bit more like a piccolo. But what's really significant is this chap here, the one on the end. It's a regal, a reed. And what's so vitally important about this is that when they put together reeds and flues into the same box, that's when the organ as we know it was really born, because you could play them together. The earliest organ wasn't just the plaything of princes and aristocrats. From the 10th century onwards, it moved into the church, where the clergy found a new range of holy jobs for it to perform. Like the chaps back here in Salamanca, this is another of their historic organs, the Salinas organ, which is a portative, which means that it was carried around on the back of a cart for religious processions. It's quite hard to imagine lugging a thing like this around, what with its bellows and everything, but lug it around they did. And as with at Corburg, you've got uh, flue pipes at the back and reeds at the front. And if you put them together, this is what they sound like. It's not just a question of putting flues and reeds together. Even a small organ has hundreds of different pipes. Now, you don't just have one note per pipe. You have lots of different pipes available to you. That's because the different materials they make pipes out of have different sounds. Lead sounds one way, tin another, for example. So I've come to Manders Organ Factory in the east end of London to see how you turn this into these. <laughs> <laughs> now having made your pipe you've then got to give it a proper sound so you come to the voicing shop now this pipe obviously isn't making much of a sound so if i hit it with this this languid here with this pointy stick um, between the upper and lower lip i think i should be able to give it a voice listen This is a rectangular wood pipe. And if I play that, you'll see there's also a stopper in the top, sometimes known as a tampon. And if I take this out, you'll see it alters the pitch quite a lot. That's a wooden pipe. And behind here is a great reed. Now, if you see this copper prong here, you'll see that it's connected. We won't see it, but underneath here, it's connected to a spring um, on the end of a tongue, a brass tongue. 
And if I move this, it makes the tongue move faster or slower and changes the pitch. <laughs> So, when you've got your pipe all voiced up, all you need is an organ to stick it in. This particular organ, which is going to a church in Nigeria, will have over 850 pipes in it. But you know, none of these pipes are going to be any good to you at all without wind. And more precisely, wind under pressure. Although the earliest organ builders experimented with hydraulic power, for the last 2,000 years, the organ has usually been blown by bellows. The most primitive bellows simply required brute force. Hence the attraction of a small organ, requiring only one assistant. But the very biggest instruments might require as many as six energetic, strapping youths to pump their bellows. So, you've got a selection of pipes and plenty of wind to blow into them. There was only one other thing you needed, and that was a limitless quantity of cash. Even a small Impress the Ambassador style one was going to set you back a few bob, never mind a big Shock the Pope style instrument. Basically, if you wanted your own organ built for you, you had to be a big shot. You had to be Holy Roman Emperor, for example. In the middle of the 16th century, the Habsburg Emperor Ferdinand I had this Hofkirche, or Chapel Royal, built in the imperial city of Innsbruck. It was intended as a great memorial to his grandfather, Maximilian I. That chapel. Ferdinand also had an organ built by a man called Ebert in 1555, and it's one of the organ world's crown jewels. During the Renaissance, the organ developed rapidly from small portable type organs like the Salinas at Salamanca into real crackers like this one. It's beautiful, isn't it? The first thing I want you to notice is the small pocket-sized organ leaning over the front, the so-called rook positive which is imitating the main case behind. What they did was put the more delicate and piquant sounds into there so that it would contrast with the main chorus. This idea of dividing the organ up into compartments was soon to become of huge importance. And there's another innovation taking place down below because we've got a keyboard for the feet. Here, look, it's laid out just like for the hands with sharps and flats and everything. These pedals, in fact, don't have their own pipes yet. They borrow from the hands above. But nevertheless, it's quite a step forward. These feet, by the way, belong to Reinhard Yaut, who is the organist here at Innsbruck. Hey, Yaut, you've got two keyboards now and pedals. What's the difference between these two manuals? The difference is that the upper manual mm -hmm. belongs to the Hauptwerk. This is the main section here. Yes, and the uh, first manual belongs to the Rück positive. And it's called a Rück positive because your back is to it, and, and the German word for back is Rück, yeah. isn't it? Yes. We can say that the Rück positive is a miniature. It's a miniature version of the main chorus. Hey, out, is it possible to play on the pedals the same sort of things that you could play on the manuals? Yes. I can show you this. I play a little phrase on the Manuel. The original spot for this organ should have been down there at the side of the nave, but the emperor was such an organ fan that he insisted it be placed right up here, opposite his own private imperial box. what happened next, we have to head north, across the Alps, where emperors were going out of fashion. In 
Germany, Holland and Scandinavia, folk were in a rather more independent frame of mind. And it wasn't so much royal pride they wanted to celebrate as civic and regional pride. And what better way to do so than by building yourself a glorious organ? What all these towns' organs had in common was a revolutionary method of construction, a method that was not only efficient, but also cunningly flexible. It was called Werkprinzip. And here in St. Jacob's Church, Ludingwert, on the north coast of Germany, there is a spectacular example of early Werkprinzip design. What they did was to divide the organ up into separate sections, each with its own case, its own wind chest, its own pipes, and even its own manual or keyboard. These divisions were called Werk, and each Werk had its own particular sound quality and job. What's more, like with the Lego set, you could always add a new Werk at a later date when funds allowed. In other words, the modular organ was born. Up there is the Hauptwerk, the main chorus of the organ, sometimes known as the Oberwerk. And down here, a Ruck positive. In between the two, above the player's head, in the breast of the instrument, is a cheeky little Brustwerk. And finally, the pedals were given a home of their own. On either side, these tall towers were built to accommodate the new, deeper tone sounds. This organ was built at the end of the 16th century, and it's probably true to say that since that time, not a single organ has been built that doesn't owe something to the Werkprinzip revolution. And it's no accident that this development had a dynamic effect on composers. It was like writing for string quartet instead of just solo violin, or like a painter being given a whole new palette of colours. With Werk Princip, the organ came of age, and the music it made possible has an energy and an intensity that has rarely been matched. In a remote and forgotten corner of northern Spain, there is an organ El Dorado, an amazing